Welcome to our review for exam two for Math 1060 Trigonometry for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Um, if you're watching this video, it means you've probably already taken exam number one. Um, and so specific policies, uh, procedures, timing of the exam, I'm not really gonna go into here because uh, many of those policies and procedures will be identical to what you saw on exam number one, so refer to that. And also specific like time, place, and manner uh, changes from semester to semester. So please, in that regard, please consult the syllabus or the information on Canvas. Or if you do have any questions about those specific things, feel free to send me an email. No problem with that. Uh, for this review video, I wanna focus primarily just on the topics, the contents of exam number two uh, to help you in your studies as that's probably why you're watching uh, this video right here, of course. Uh, so for exam number two, I should mention that this will cover the topics from lecture nine all the way up to lecture 20. Lecture nine to lecture 20, uh, for which there's basically three main ideas covered on this exam. Uh, there's gonna be the topic of graphing trigonometric functions. Uh, that's what we talked about in lectures nine through 13. Uh, then the second topic will be about inverse trigonometry, the inverse trigonometric functions, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, and the like. Uh, that was talked about very briefly on, in lectures 13 and 14, but still it's a very critical topic that you'll see lots of questions about inverse trigonometric functions in this exam. And then the remaining topics, uh, specifically lectures 15 through 20 will be about trigonometric identities. This was the largest unit in our class and so they're gonna see a big portion of that on this exam. Um, also, one thing that you're going to see on this exam that you might have not seen on the previous exam is that a lot of the topics are going to be integrated together. That is, there will be questions that do involve topics from multiple sections. Uh, just, just for a few examples, right? Uh, we will, we, we've covered how to compute inverse trigonometric functions, things like sine of tar, arc tangent of x, how do, you, how do you compute something like that? But then later on in, in unit six, when we learned about trigonometric identities, we combined that so we could do things like sine of arc tangent of one half plus arc cosine of one third, things like that. So many topics will be integrated together and you'll see that, and I'll point these things out uh, throughout this video right here. The length of the exam will be the same as the previous exam. You'll see 15 questions. Uh, nine of those questions will be in the multiple choice section, uh, which they're worth five points each. Remember in the multiple choice section, you will not be allowed any, uh, any notes or calculator with the exception of a formula sheet that will be provided to you. And on that formula sheet, you will have uh, many of your desired trigonometric identities, uh, the fundamental ones and many of the families we've talked about. So that'll be of great help to you on that section. Uh, questions 10 through, well, technically 16, but 10 through 15 uh, will be in the free response section for which most of those questions will be worth 10 points. Question 10 will be only worth five. Question 12 will be worth eight. Um, and then also question 16, which is just turn in your note card type question that's worth two as usual. So let's get into the nitty gritty topics of this exam. So in the multiple choice section, we'll start with that. Let's look at question number one. Question number one, you'll be asked to compute without a calculator, because remember every question in the multiple choice section will have no calculator allowed. So you have to do this on your own. And question number one will ask you to compute the value of an inverse trigonometric function. So can you compute arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, arc secant, arc cosecant, arc cotangent without a calculator? Now, this, this uh, when you have an inverse trigonometric function, the number you put in is the ratio. The thing you get out will be the angle, which that angle could be expressed in radians. As you see right here, every option is in radians, or that option could be in degrees. It, it'll depend on the multiple choice question, so you should be familiar with both. Now, what ratios do you need to know? Well, this is gonna coincide with our special angles. So thinking of, thinking of our classic uh, unit circle diagram right here, you need to know zero degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. You need to know sine, cosine, uh, their ratios for those five special angles in the first quadrant. And as such, you should also be able to compute 
tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant for those five special angles. But that also encompasses the other angles on our unit circle diagram that reference these. So you should be able to do things like 120 degrees, 135 degrees in the second quadrant. You should be able to do 300 degrees in the third quadrant, 270 degrees, etc. So you should know those angles from the first exam. And now the inverse trigonometric ratios are going to go the other way around. You give, given the ratio, you need to find the angle. Um, so be able to identify those for ex question number one. Uh, clearly, question number one has to do with inverse trigonometric functions. So that was talked about in lecture 14. Now, technically, lecture 13 is also in our unit on that regard. Lecture 13 focused primarily on the general idea of an inverse function. And then lecture 14, uh, it focused exclusively on inverse trigonometric functions. So I would primarily point you to lecture 14 in that regard. Uh, question number two is going to hit on the second main topic about graphing. Um, so you'll be given a trigonometric function. Uh, so sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. We learned how to graph each and every one of these. Um, transformations applied to the function change aspects about it. So this question specifically is asking about the amplitude. How do you identify the amplitude of a sinusoidal wave? What about a period change? What about shifting of some time? Shift up, shift down, reflections. So really question number two is going to ask you to analyze the properties or the anatomy of a trigonometric graph. So uh, I would I would tell you to primarily focus on for this for this lecture here, you're primarily going to focus on 10 and 11. Because uh, this is when we talked about transformations to uh, sinusoidal waves. So how you transform sine or cosine. Um, of course, you do need to know lecture 9, where many properties of the trigonometric functions were discussed. But these were without transformations whatsoever. And then also lecture 12 is relevant here as well. Uh, because lecture 12, we focused on graphs of the non-sinusoidal trigonometric graphs. So tangent, secant, etc. Uh, but like I said, primarily this lex this question will focus on 10 and 11, but these other topics will be of interest to you as you're studying. Uh, question number three will also be a question about graphing. In this question, you will be given the graph of a trigonometric function, and then you'll be asked to identify, at least by the process of elimination, which of these formulas produce this graph. So there's really two ways you could approach this. Again, you could just do process of elimination. Well, that can't be right, that can't be right, that can't be right until you get to whatever you think the correct answer is. Or you come to this graph and analyze things like what's the amplitude? What's the period? Is there a shift? Is there a reflection? Does it look like a sine? Does it look like a cosine? Does it look like a tangent? So you want to recognize the graph and then find the formula you think is the correct answer, assuming that that, that one. I, I don't claim the one I just circled was the correct answer as well. So I, I tell you to consult the same sections, right? Uh, focus primarily on 10 and 11. But of course, you do need to know lecture 9, which is the basic shapes of these graphs, especially sine and cosine. And then maybe you'll get a tangent or secant or something. So be be with be familiar with lecture 12 as well. But again, primarily 10 and 11 is when we did things like this. Uh, question number four, which is the last question of the first page of the multiple choice section. In this question, you'll be asked to compute a sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, or cotangent for an angle which is a, a multiple of 15. Let's just say it that way. Um, because again, with that unit circle diagram we drew earlier, uh, you should know multiples of 30, you should know multiples of 45 pretty well, right? So 0, 30, 45, 60, 90, and then continue on in that direction to 120, 135. You get the idea. What, uh, you know, keep on going in that direction. We should be able, you should be able to do those, but how do you do something like sine of 15 degrees? Well, 15 degrees, you'll notice, um, is half of 30 degrees. So that's not what I meant to write. Uh, it's half of 30 degrees. So if we know sine of 30 degrees, we could use a half angle identity to find sine of 15 degrees. Or even better, 15 degrees is 45 degrees minus 30 degrees, like so. So you use like an angle difference identity. Or another possibility is what about 75 degrees? 75 degrees is 45 degrees plus 30 degrees, for example. So could you compute secant of 75 degrees? Absolutely, because you could compute cosine of 75 degrees using the angle sum identities. Um, and so that's how this is going to work. There's going to be these memorized angles. You need to know sine of 30, 45, 
all of these angles we talked about on question number one, you need to know all of those. Those need to be memorized because um, you won't have notes that allow you to do those things. At the very least, remember how to reconstruct this unit circle diagram on the fly, right? You think of your hand, right? You have your five fingers. Oh boy, that's, that's a great drawing there. Think of your fingers, right? And you have zero, you know, 30, 45, uh, 60, 90, right? Those are the five special angles in the first quadrant. And remember the pattern, you know, for, for cosine, it's going to go one root three over two, root two over two. You get the idea. Remember that pattern. You do need to know that for this exam. Otherwise, some of these questions will be very basically impossible to do. Now, question number four, you do need to know those special angles and things that reference to them. But to do these multiples of 15, like 15, 75, etc., cetera, uh, you need to use appropriate trigonometric identities. Now, while you do have to have those special angles memorized, the trigonometric identities will be available to you on a formula sheet. So this, these identities will include the fundamental identities we talked about. So the Pythagorean identity, uh, the ratio, the reciprocal identities, uh, the sy symmetry identities, the co-function identities, complementary identities. You need to know those ones, but they will be on the formula sheet. Uh, you'll have the angle sum and the angle difference identities. These will be on the formula sheet. You'll have the double angle identities. That'll be on the formula sheet. You'll have the half angle identities. Those will be on the formula sheet. So if the, any of those are appropriate for question number four, other questions, you are welcome to consult them. Um, you will also have the product to sum identities. You'll have the sum to product identities as well. Those ones are very difficult to memorize, but those, no worries, those will be on your formula sheet. So combine those with um, with the angle, special angles you memorize, and you could be able to do something like number four without a calculator whatsoever. Uh, so moving on to the next page in the multiple choice section, you got question number five. You'll be asked to identify, uh, you know, basically some more properties of trigonometric graphs, particularly lecture nine and lecture 12 will be very important here. Uh, so, for example, you might be asked a question, when is sine equal to zero? That is, when are, where are the x-intercepts of sine? Where are the x-intercepts of cosine, of tangent, of cotangent? Where are the x-intercepts of secant or cosecant? Well, in that say, situation, they don't have any, so you'd select something like do not, they don't exist, D and E. Um, could you identify what the amplitude of a standard sine or cosine wave is? No transformations whatsoever, periods. Um, could you identify where the vertical asymptotes of tangent secant, uh, tangent secant, cosecant, or cotangent are. Could you identify where's a maximum for sine, where's a minimum of sine, where's a maximum for cosine, uh, et cetera, those type of things. So you'll be asked to, to, to provide some basic information, some basic properties of the graph of tangent and uh, sine, all those trigonometric functions. Question number six, this question, you'll be given either a product of trigonometric functions for which you'll turn it into a summer difference, or you'll be given a summer difference and be asked to turn it into a product of trigonometric functions. So as you might be able to guess, you will need to use the product to sum identities or the sum to product identities. You do not need to memorize these identities because they will be provided to you on the formula sheet, but you do need to know how to use them to convert from products to sums or sums to products. And so this is something we talked about in great detail, of course, in lecture number 20. So that's definitely the one you wanna see there. Uh, question number seven, uh, you'll be asked to compute uh, the trigonometric ratio of an angle defined using an inverse trigonometric function. So you have tangent of cosine inverse of x right here. And this is gonna be left as a variable, that's okay. Uh, in, in regard of your ratio, just treat the ratio as x over 1. Um, and so then you have to compute the cosine or tangent ratio of x over 1. I would recommend drawing your right triangle diagrams right here, um, which, you know, you call the you call the inverse function theta or whatever. So you'll draw your triangle label sides and then compute the ratio from your triangle. Uh, that's, that's how I'd recommend doing that. This was one of the main topics we talked about in lecture 14 about trigonometric inverses. So be prepared to do that for question number seven. Question number eight, uh, you'll be asked to compute a trigonometric ratio using uh, trigonometric identities where some information on trigonometric functions will be given. So like in this example, you are given the cosine ratio and you're given the angles for which A lives between. So, okay, we see that A resides in the fourth quadrant. And then you'll be asked, in this case, you'll be asked to compute cosine of A over two, 
uh, but we could be asked to find uh, cosine of 2a. Maybe two ratios are given, two angles are given, a and b. So you might be asked to compute like what's cosine of a plus b. We saw several examples like this in the in the homework, in the lecture series. So given some information about tr the trigonometric ratios about the angle, find other information using identities. That's gonna be the main takeaway for question number eight. So this, of course, you know, this, this we could find things from lectures 15 all the way to 20. Uh, this particular question clearly is using the half angle identity, which was covered um, in lecture 19, I believe. But we did similar things with double angles in lecture 18. We did things with angle sums um, and angle differences in lecture 17. So be able to compute trigonometric ratios knowing some information about the trigonometric ratios of the original angle and then modified using trigonometric identities. All right. And then question number nine, this is the last question, the multiple choice section. You'll be give, you'll have to compute a trigonometric substitution using some type of identity, right? So you're given the substitution x equals four sine of theta. So remember, this leads itself to some type of trigonometric, uh, right triangle, excuse me, right triangle diagram uh, with respect to theta. With that diagram, you can then say things about trigonometric ratios like sine, cosine, tangent, etc. But then you have to simplify, or you have to write the trigonometric expression in this case sine of 2 theta over 4 in an algebraic sense so how do you rewrite this thing uh, with no variable theta whatsoever well because you have things like double angles right double 2 theta is not the same angle as theta so you'd have to use some type of trigonometric identity uh, the double angle identity seems appropriate here to rewrite this in terms of just the algebraic expressions you have to rewrite this expression just in terms of theta and then once you have it in theta you can use the triangle to write it in terms of just this algebraic expression whatsoever here and so again we did several of these examples throughout uh, throughout unit six about uh, trigonometric identities so consult those ones as well uh, lectures 15 through 20 uh, 30 not that's not right 20 uh, we did these type of trigonometric substitutions back on exam one but now we're using trigonometric identities to help us uh, compute these things and that brings us to the end of the multiple choice section the no calculator section so do remember that in this section uh, you're not allowed to calculate no 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 notes except for the formula sheet i mentioned um, there's also no partial credit just based upon the answer you select so make sure you, you're very careful and check your work there there will be some space provided some blank space provided on the page for you can write but of course no work is necessary you won't be graded on that whatsoever so moving to the free response section, the free response section is shorter in that it only contains six questions, although these questions are a little bit more involved. They're worth more points in general, um, and you can get partial credit based upon um, the work you show, and you are expected to show all of your work on these questions as is appropriate. So let's talk about the specifics of this. Uh, question number 10, you'll be asked to graph a trigonometric function. This one will not be sine or cosine. There'll be a question later on that asks you to graph sine and cosine because uh, we spent a lot more time on graphing sine and cosine than we did the other four. So question number 10, it's only worth five points. So it's actually on par with the multiple choice question. Um, really though, I put this in the free response because graphing becomes a lot harder. It, I, I, should, I shouldn't say harder. Graphing becomes a lot different when it's a multiple choice versus you actually draw the graph yourself, which is what you're expected to do. So on this one, on question number 10, you'll be asked to graph uh, just a single cycle, one complete cycle of a tangent, a cotangent, a secant, or a cosecant graph. Um, there will be some very minimal transformations going into play here. So like this one is just tangent of 2x. What does that 2 do to the graph? Um, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant do have um, vertical asymptotes. So do make sure to include any of those asymptotes on there. Label the x-intercept. If it exists, if there's a midline uh, that is that's been modified, if there's some shifting of some kind, you might want to add that midline to your graph. Um, and there you go. There's really not a lot of work you can show. I mean, there are some things like you could you could list what 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 is two doing here? Is it a period change? Is it an amplitude change? Is it a shift? You could list some of the transformations over here. That's some good partial credit. Um, and then draw your things on the grid lines provided. Um, while some of these things are, per, are listed for you, some of these things might not. You can, of course, change the labels if you think that's very appropriate for you as you graph this thing. This one's worth only five points, and this will be a question directly taken from lecture 12 about graphing uh, the trigonometric functions other than sine and cosine. We'll get to that one in a second. Uh, question number 11, I, for, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this video, in fact, you'll be asked to compute 
uh, a trigonometric expression that involves inverse trigonometric functions, but also will require identities of some kind. So on this question, you have these two inverse trigonometric functions. Each, each and every one of them represents an angle, like angle alpha, angle beta, but then we've added them together. So this thing is like equivalent to sine of alpha plus beta. You might want to use an angle sum or angle difference identity to help you out here. We did some other examples similar to this involving double angles or half angles. So use your Use your knowledge of inverse trigonometric evaluation combined with your trigonometric identities. So this is really combining unit five about inverse trigonometric functions. Again, that's primarily lecture 14, but it's going to be combined with our topics of from unit six about uh, trigonometric identities. So this is like 15 through 20. Which trigonometric identity will be appropriate? Uh, well, it could be any of them, honestly. But now you don't have the formula sheet on this portion of the test, but you also you are allowed your note card and you can put whatever on that whatever you can put whatever on that note card that you want, anything whatsoever. So if you want to just vomit all of the trig identities that were on that formula sheet onto your note card, do so. I would just suggest you write small uh, and be prepared to do things like this. So what I would want to see is I definitely want to know what identities you're gonna do. You should represent these things as angles, you know, like alpha and beta would be appropriate here. And then draw the triangles, right? There's a triangle for alpha. Um, if two angles are in play, there's a triangle for beta. You could do something like that as well. Um, and then in the end, you should have a number. Um, in, in the end, this should be a number. That's the final value you should be looking for. Uh, question number 12 uh, and question number 13 will be asking you to prove trigonometric identities. We did this a lot in the homework. It's not just about using identities for computation. It's also about proving trigonometric identities. And you'll see these, of course, in the free response section. Question number 12 um, is only worth eight points. Question number 10 is worth 10. Um, excuse me, question number 13 is worth 10. And that's because on par, 13 will be a, a harder question than number 12. And I'll explain why. When it comes to question number 12, you will only need the fundamental identities to prove this thing, right? Only the fundamental identities will be necessary, none of the more exotic ones. So again, the Pythagorean identities, symmetry, complementary, ratio, reciprocals will be what you see here. Um, you see, of course, with the angles, all of the angles in play are theta. So you probably wouldn't need the symmetry. Symmetry comes into play if you have a negative angle. Um, you probably don't need the complementary ones either because that's if you take like 90 degrees minus theta. Uh, so probably you can get away with just the Pythagorean identities. Maybe, I don't see any squares, so I don't suspect uh, any type of Pythagorean identities necessary. Maybe just reciprocals and ratios, what have you. Uh, but remember the tips we've learned about proving trigonometric identities. Some of the important ones I'll mention right here. Start with the left-hand side, or you can start with the right-hand side if you think it's more complicated. Pick the more complicated side. And then doing you know equality after equality after equality end up with the right hand side that's what i should expect to see if i see like a stack you know you're just you're doing uh you're working on the two sides simultaneously that's a big no-no that would forfeit most of the points on this question potentially all of them uh, so don't do that um, remember you can use algebraic things like foil distributed uh distribute things clear denominators multiply by conjugate algebraic stuff is useful here if you get stuck you can switch the things switch everything to sines and cosines admittedly that one's already there uh, but go back to the principles the tips that we gave in lectures 15 and 16 here in our lecture series there's a lot of tips given about proving trigonometric identities that's what you're going to see and that's what's going to be expected on question number 12. Question number 13 is going to be the same basic idea where you're asked to prove a trigonometric identity, but in addition to the guidelines and principles that you need to demonstrate from question number 12, you'll also need some of the more advanced identities like uh, you look here, there's this cosine squared of theta over 2. That tells me that maybe a half angle identity would be appropriate. There's also a sine squared over here, maybe Pythagorean identity or um, half angle identity could be useful there, maybe. Um, you have to go from theta halves to theta. So I would think the half angled identity would be appropriate. So can you prove trigonometric identities that use the more advanced trigonometric identities, uh, like angle and angle sum and difference identities, product to sum, sum to product, half angles, double angles, all of those angles we saw there. So really, I will list again lectures uh, 15 and 16 because you do need to know the principles, the guidelines of proving trigonometric identities, but you also need to know those identities, those more advanced identities we introduced in lectures 17 through 20. And again, these things could be listed, of course, on your note card. 
uh, that's okay, but you'll have to use them to help you out here. And that's why this one's worth a little bit more points because uh, there's a little bit more going on on question number 13. So that's gonna be the second to last page. You're gonna be asked to prove two trigonometric identities. Uh, then the last page of the exam will be about graphing. Uh, question 14 and question 15 will ask you to graph a sinusoidal wave. That is to graph either sine or cosine. So like on question number 14 worth 10 points, you see this one right here. F of X is equal to three plus two sine of one half X minus pi halves right there. So you see it's basically the whole enchilada. Uh, there is potentially a period change, a uh, amplitude change. Maybe we can potentially have a horizontal shift, a vertical shift of reflection could all be involved in these things right here. Um, and so you'll be asked to graph this function. Now you only have to graph uh, let's see, what does it say? You really only have to graph one complete cycle. That's sufficient for these periodic functions. If you get one cycle, you can get it all. There's no labels on the graph on the grid lines whatsoever. So label them as appropriate. And one of the tricks about graphing a, a trigonometric function, honestly, is that, uh, you know, if you if you put the labels at the very end, it's like always the exact same picture, what have you. Um, you do need to identify the transformations applied to sine for this one or cosine if it was. So you'd be like, what does this three do? What does this two do? What does this one half do? And so we'd say things like, oh, the amplitude has now been changed to whatever. The period's been changed to whatever. There's been a shift of this upward. There's been a shift to the right by this. So list specifically what those transformations are. Um, I should, of course, mention that if you look at the solutions to the practice exam, you can see exactly the type of things you need to show. And then, of course, you need to graph the function over here. Um, you need to include at least three points so I know what's going on here. But when it comes to graphing these sinusoidal waves, really, there are always five points you want to graph, right? So like for sine, you have the original x-intercept, you have a maximum, you have the next x-intercept, you have a minimum, then you have an x-intercept again. And so that's your typical sinusoidal cycle there. Um, so you do that for cosine, of course, you start at a max, then you get an x-intercept, then you get the min, then you get an x-intercept, then you get the max again. So really, there's like five points you really should be including. Um, I'll put it as a minimum of three, but if, if you really want to get full credit here, you should be shooting for five to make sure your graph looks pretty good. All right. And then the last question, question number 15, which admittedly there's question number 16, but that's just a reminder to tell you to turn in your note card when you turn in your exam. Uh, that's just a pass fail thing. That should be pretty easy. Uh, but question number 15 will ask you to prove, uh, excuse me, will ask you to graph a trigonometric function. Uh, this one will seemingly look harder than question number 14, but that's because we need to first simplify this thing and then graph it. So using, uh, using trigonometric identities, again, like the Pythagorean identity, double angle identity, etc. cetera. Uh, so using all of those identities for which, again, the identities we talked about in lectures 15 through 20, using some type of identities, which you probably have these on your, either have them memorized or have them on your note card, using some type of identities, you can simplify the thing, and then it'll simplify to be something like you saw above. It'll look like, you know, worst case scenario, y equals k plus a sine or cosine of, say, b, I'll, I'll write it this way, x minus h over b, something like this. Again, sine or cosine, Worst case scenario, you get something like this. But then you can graph this using the techniques you saw, the same techniques used in number 14. Now, the thing is, this one, once you've simplified it, won't be as complicated as you saw on question number 14. So you won't see like every possible transformation in play here. Graph it here uh, when you're done. And then graph it from 0 to 2 pi. So that might be multiple cycles. That could be half of a cycle. The thing is, we're going to graph it from 0 to 2 pi. So it doesn't exactly predict what type of potential period changes could be happening. Maybe there are some, maybe they're not. So in terms of graphing, this will be an easier graphing question, but you do have to use identities to simplify it first. So you do need to know the principles of graphing. It will be a sine or cosine, of course. So you're gonna be graph, you know, we learned how to graph those in lectures nine through 11. It'll be an easier graphing question, but you do have to use the identities to simplify it. Uh, question number 14 will be the most challenging graphing question possible here. And it will be sine or cosine. So again, be able to graph something as complicated at the as at the end of lecture 11. So lecture 11 is really where it's at. We build up to these more complicated graphs at the end of number 11. So that's what you should be able to do. All right, so that finishes exam number two. 
Um, that finishes the, the, the free response section as well. Um, and so hopefully this gives you a good idea of the topics that are gonna be expected for this exam. Um, please consult the other review materials that you have available to you for this course. Um, and of course, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to ask me. I'm here to help you as much as I'm able to do so. Best of luck on this exam and I'll see you next time.